Welcome to my channel. This is an indication of some of the things that I cover on a regular basis in my videos. If you haven't already subscribed, please feel free to do so. And don't forget to click the little bell so that you'll get notified of future videos. Please feel free to share my videos on your social media. And I hope you enjoy the video which follows. Well, hello everybody. As the title indicates, I'm going to make Parker House rolls, uh, taking them to a Christmas party time of year when you have to start cooking and thinking about what you're going to take to the Christmas parties, I guess. Parker House Rolls were made famous by the Parker House Hotel in Boston in the 19th century, mid-1800s. Still made, and if you go online and do a search for recipes, there's a dozen different ways to make them, so whose recipe is authentic, it's very hard to say. But I'm following one that I, I like the looks of because it makes what I, what I want. It, it makes two dozen. Uh, rolls and some of the other ones make considerably less. So I have the ingredients laid out here. There's six cups of all-purpose flour. May or may not use the whole thing, but you'll see what I mean as we go on. A cup and a half of milk, a stick of butter, um, and they call for unsalted butter. My butter is salted. So the next ingredient down here is a teaspoon and a half of salt. I eliminated half a teaspoon because if there's already salt in the butter. So I'm just using one teaspoon of salt. And I'm using the instant yeast. Um, so I'm using a tablespoon. It says one packet of uh, regular dry yeast. I'm using a, a tablespoon rather of the instant yeast. Three eggs, and I've have to, I had to come to it. I've bought eggs <laughs> this time of year lately. With with older hens, I end up buying eggs for a month or so. But as soon as the days start lengthening out, some of the older girls will start laying eggs again. Uh, a half cup of sugar and a half cup of water. And I'm adding the half cup of water. I will put it in when I put the rest of the liquids on in just a moment to heat up on the stove. But their reason for the half cup of water is to proof the yeast in. And with instant yeast, you don't have to do that. I'm still adding the liquid just so that I'll have the same liquid that they're having for the rest of the recipe. So let's get started here. Well, a cup and a half of milk. And in my case, I'm also adding the half cup of water. If you were using the regular sachets of, of yeast, you would be proving the yeast in that half cup of water. Now, I, this just gets brought to a simmer. A good flame going here. I guess we do. Not a boil, but uh, as soon as you see it starting to have a little steam come off of it. And I'll bring you back when it reaches that stage. Well, it's just starting to shimmer, and I stuck a finger in. It's Plenty hot enough, I guess. We'll say that's good enough. Now you add the butter, one stick of butter, that's a quarter of a pound of butter, and the half cup of sugar. The heat shut off, I'm just stirring this until that's melted. I'll have to cool a bit. Melting it will also cool it down. But Put it in with the yeast too soon and it'll kill the yeast. I don't want it to be hot at all when it goes into the rest of the mixture. Well, let's move over to the stand mixer and combine some of the other ingredients. Now to start with, we use half of the flour. So that's three cups of flour. That's the final cup going in there now. As I said before, I'm using the instant yeast, one tablespoon. teaspoon of salt and I'm putting them on opposite sides. I really don't know if that makes any difference or not, but do you watch the uh, great British baking show on television with Paul Hollywood and Mary Berry? When they do their specialty uh, programs, just themselves cooking rather than the contestants, Paul always insists that you put the yeast on one side and the salt on the other. And uh, he is a, a master baker, so I'm I'm assuming he knows what he's talking about. Yeast is a retarder, and it uh, will slow down fermentation. So it's used in bread also to enhance the flavor, of course, but... Oh, 
but to slow down the fermentation. The slower the fermentation, the more flavor you get out of the out of the bread. So, following Paul Hollywood's instructions, there's the three eggs, lightly beaten. And I think what I'll do is let that start and add the milk and the butter and the sugar as it's going here. And that gets mixed until it just comes together and is sort of smooth before we start adding the, the rest of the flour. So. I'll bring you back in a minute or two. Well, I think that has combined nicely. Now you continue adding the remainder of the flour about a half cup at a time. Uh, that way you can judge where to stop. You may not need it all. As each half cup combines, you add another one. The goal is to get the dough to come away from the sides of the bowl. Form sort of a ball, and at that point we take it out and do some hand kneading. So I'll bring you back when I have it at that phase, I guess. I guess you can see that down in there, it is sort of coming away into a ball a bit there. Does a little bit more every time I add some extra flour. And I still have about a half a cup of flour, but that might get incorporated as I do the hand kneading. So I'm going to take it out and put it on the floured surface now. Floured the surface with some more of the all purpose flour. Certainly, what you would call an enriched dough. Eggs and sugar and butter and all that sort of thing in it. So it's quite yellow. I suppose that's because of the butter and the egg yolks. That just about covers it. Yeah, it's good to have a little flour on your hands when you start this. But this just gets kneaded for a few minutes to see if it needs to work in any more of the. Uh, flour. Feels nice and warm still, so I think this is probably going to rise quite quickly. And I don't know, I'm somewhere between a quarter and a half cup of the flour left over. That's the reason I, I wish we used weights instead of volume because I probably still used six cups of, of flour. It's just, it compacts when you're measuring it with the cup, measuring all that sort of stuff. If you were using weights you wouldn't have that problem. But evidently recipes here in this country in the US are never going to change. It's always going to be the dry measure. A lot of them now, though, I must admit, with like sites like King Arthur Flower and some of the other sites, you can uh, choose whether you want to use weights, either metric or the English weights. Didn't see that there was a possibility of that on this one. I don't think I've said, but I will, of course, be putting the link below the video to the recipe that I'm using anyway. about enough kneading. Now it goes in a, a greased bowl and anywhere from an hour to an hour and a half until it doubles in bulk 
Um, it usually depends on several factors. Temperature of the dough being one of them. And as I say, this is a warm dough, but also the temperature of the room. So, hour, hour and a half. Whenever you feel that it's doubled or close to doubled in bulk. So I'll bring you back and give you a look at that in just a second. Uh, in, a, in an oiled or greased bowl, and all I've done is spray this bowl with cooking spray. I use a generic brand, but anyway, it's just an oil that you spray. I like this bowl though because it comes with this nice plastic cover and you haven't got to try to put plastic wrap over it. And that just gets set aside in a warm location, wherever the warmest place in your house is, I guess, for an hour to an hour and a half until it's doubled in bulk. So I'll see you back here in an hour and a half. Well, I let it go the full hour and a half. I'm not so sure if that was actually necessary, but that's what I did. And as you can see, it definitely doubled in bulk and then some. Now it just gets knocked down. And on a floured surface, you just knead it a little bit. Knock the air out of it, basically. Necessary, but I'm going to weigh it. I won't know it accurately, but it'll give me an idea of what they should each one should weigh out at. So it's like the grams, I guess, if I can. Yep. So it's 1637, let's say 1640 grams. That's 68 grams each, um, so you know somewhere around 70 grams or so each. I won't be that accurate, but I I don't like to end up with tiny ones and big ones. So I'm going to bake mine on a baking tray lined with parchment paper. You could use a buttered baking tray. 1 just get brought over into this an area where there isn't quite so much flour and shake them into a ball baking them like this on a tray uh, will make it so that uh, the sides are extra soft because they'll all sort of join together as they bake. And then you soften the tops up by buttering generously when they're still hot. Melted butter, so I'm not sure how many, how many across I can do here. Probably four across. We'll see. Maybe, maybe only three across, I guess. I'll bring you back anyway once I have got them all divided and on the tray here. I changed my method slightly in, in shaping them. I wasn't getting the shape that I wanted. So I'm taking it, each piece, and, and just bringing the sides into the middle until you have a smooth top, and then doing the rounding thing. That gives you a much more uniform roll. It's a great dough to work with. We can get over how much it rose in that hour and a half. So, I'll bring you back shortly. 
I ended up with one shy. I have 23 instead of 24. Now they get covered with a tea towel and allowed to rise again until they're double in bulk and that should take anywhere from a half hour to 45 minutes and in the meantime you preheat the oven to 350 degrees Fahrenheit. Well they've had 45 minutes to do their rising. I guess they've practically doubled in size anyway and now they go in the preheated 350 degree Fahrenheit oven for 20 minutes or until they are a golden brown color on top. And I'll show you when they come out of the oven. Well, they certainly grew while they were in the oven. Now you just brush the top liberally with melted butter as if there wasn't already enough butter in this, but that's the whole idea of Parker Rose Rolls, I think, is they are a fortified dough, lots of butter, and then lots of butter added afterward. Not quite that much, I got swimming down in there. I'll let these cool a bit and then I'll try one of them. so good. Bring you back after they have cooled. Well, the butter has been absorbed and they're still quite hot. I'll take one and see what I can do with it here. Hotter than they should be for cutting them or anything. But I've got to dry it. I'm just going to butter it by using the, the butter brush some of the melted butter that was left over. Like this thing needs more butter, right? Try the crusty top part. Here goes. Mm. Obviously they're buttery. Very soft. And what I meant to say while I was doing these is they freeze very nicely. So if you make like I've made here two dozen and don't have an immediate use for them, they can be put in the refrigerator, in the freezer rather, in, you know, half a dozen in each package or whatever, and uh, bring them out when you need them. Uh, a minute or two in a hot oven, or less than that in a microwave, just to refresh them after they've thawed up, and they're just as good as when they first came out of the oven. I also meant to say that there isn't any reason at all if you don't have a stand mixer that you couldn't uh, mix these by hand. You just have to do a bit more kneading. Uh, then that I had to do at the end here. You have to do that first initial kneading that the um, stand mixer did, but they would work out just as well done by hand. And I hope you'll give these a try. Thank you very much for watching.